Rents would vary according to which builder owned the lease. But people wanted to make a profit, so anyone wanting to live in this shiny new development needed proper employment. In the early years, there was a wide variety of occupations, ranging from a music publisher to an errand boy. Florence Barker, Draper's assistant, born 1871. There are 12 people living in this house, and my name is Tom Shepherd, and I was born here in 1867, and I work on the transport system. Tom Ashdown, born 1856, food and sanitary inspector. So the West family were quite particular about renting to people in employment, and to ensure their tenants enjoyed good spiritual health, James West helped fund the building of a church in nearby Thorburn Square. In the late 1850s, a young curate called Thornton Wilkinson was given the task of actually founding a congregation in this area. And Thornton Wilkinson uh, did it by standing on street corners and, and holding impromptu services. He'd done that for quite some time, very bravely, where, when a group of people who must have had some money came to him one day and said, look, lad, we've seen you. Uh, we admire what you're doing. We'll build a church for you. And he is, in fact, named on here. Oh, right, OK. J.R. West Esquire. Yeah. He's giving £100 to the contributions for the new St Anne's Church, right. which was to be built in Thorburn Square, and it's on that map. And is the church still there? Uh, there is still a church there, yes. Uh, he's giving twice as much as the Bishop of Winchester on this list. <laughs> when Booth paid his visit in 1900, the vicar of St Anne's was a Mr Walsh. The vicar mentioned the reluctance of men to attend organised religion, saying, it is no use blinking the fact that the bulk of our congregation are boys and women. You cannot get the men to church. So the women of Reverdy Road attended church regularly and made a good impression on their vicar. Perhaps it was the air of hard-working respectability that led him to describe his parish as the Belgravia of Bermondsey. His wife had formed a different view and spoke despairingly about her life in what she called the desert of Bermondsey. Her middle-class snobbery about the local women was undisguised. The women think themselves ladies. That is the word that expresses it best. Ladies. It is terrible. What do they do? Well, it's very difficult to say. They are very difficult to classify, and most are a very mixed set. Life down here is very hard for my daughters, as except for the local clergy, there is no one to know. Mr. Stobart is a snob, and Mr. Ainsworth is a cad. And as for the wife of the latter, she is an obnoxious person, impossible. Poor Mrs. Walsh marooned amongst the proles with no one to speak to. At the other end of the street, Dr. Cooper, was able to bridge the class divide as a popular GP and member of parliament. He died at home in 1909 after a late sitting in the House of Commons. By 1920, the surgery had been taken over by Dr. Alfred Salter, a Republican and pacifist. Alfred Salter was born in Greenwich in 1873. He trained at Guy's Hospital and took up residence in the Bermondsey settlement in 1898. He married Ada in 1900. Writing to Ada just before they married, Alfred Salter said this, I've no lingering hankering for the flesh bots of Sudbury or Guy's or Harley Street, but I have sometimes quailed before the dull, interminable, leisureless grind, the weary monotonous treadmill of work that certainly awaits me if I have to practice down here among the working people of Bermondsey. Alfred considered himself to be a Christian missionary and described his work as a divine vocation and said in a letter to his wife, Ada, we are to be given over to the service of Bermondsey, to be her faithful servants, to live for her, if need be, to give our lives for her. He began to work with Bermondsey Council on a mission 
to put in place a radical set of public health measures. Well, I knew about Dr Salter because, in the fact, um, he used to... Um, it was him that got the council to send a van round with pictures. Um, used to cl these vans used to open up the back and they used to have a screen there and the pictures were health hygiene and all that kind of thing, you know, uh, to keeping everybody um, sort of healthy. Uh, you should always wash your hands and show your hands sort of thing, you know, and uh, children walking about, things like that. As kids, we just sat there, stood there, watched it, you know, until it was the thing was finished, they closed the things and away they went to somewhere else. That was good. It was good. Free pictures. Alfred Salter had started out as an idealistic young doctor. He made a big impression on Charles Booth, who met him in 1900 and wrote the following. Mr Salter is above average, a cheery, pleasant fellow whose visits are more likely to be welcome and much more tactful than many of his brother missionaries in approaching the spiritual side of his task. The teetotal doctor liked to joke that he charged publicans' wives double for his services. Everyone else paid what they could afford. If they couldn't afford the treatment, it was free. He was a familiar sight, peddling the streets of Bermondsey on his bike and became immensely popular with his patients. If we are a little sick, mother sends for Dr Khan. But if we are proper sick, she sends for Dr Salter. A man turned up to the surgery one day with his wife and was told that Dr Salter was away, but that he could see another doctor. However, the man said that no one else would do for his wife, not even if it was the bloke who does for the Queen. Bermondsey had the highest rates of scarlet fever in London. Overcrowding and proximity to the river meant this highly contagious bacterial illness spread rapidly and often with deadly effect. Today, it's easily treated with antibiotics but in the early decades of the 20th century, scarlet fever was a killer. Alfred and Ada lost their beloved daughter, Joyce, to the fever. She was eight years old. But their tragic loss did not deter them from continuing their work in Bermondsey. Alfred Salter never wavered in his commitment to the people of the borough, and he was most concerned to tackle the social conditions that gave rise to illness, as revealed in another of his letters to his wife. I've been paying numerous visits to derelict families all the afternoon and evening. Several of the homes I've just been into have made me feel aghast at my helplessness to lift their occupants out of their existing poverty and squalor. Oh, the cruelty and wickedness of this society today. Like Dr. Cooper before him, Salter embraced politics, first for Bermondsey Council and then as a Labour Member of Parliament. Ada was also a politician and became the Mayor of Bermondsey. The Salters were part of a political movement that dominated the politics of the early 20th century. It could be called municipal socialism. They were intent on creating a new Bermondsey, a place with decent homes and green spaces, and they were intent on eliminating the diseases of poverty. People used to talk endlessly about the trees, which I believe Dr Salter had trees planted. And, and apparently, we were told as kids it was one of the first areas in London that had trees, you know, working class area, I suppose. Working with the council, the Salters were responsible for planting more than 10,000 trees throughout the borough of Bermondsey. Reverdy Road became tree-lined. Alfred said of this venture, the trees not only add to the beauty of the neighborhood all through the spring, summer and autumn, but the green matter of the leaves is purifying the atmosphere and helping to make Bermondsey a more healthy place.
The Salter's life of self-sacrifice gave hope to many. Though through their efforts, both medically and socially, Bermondsey became a better place. The Salters, working with the council, had an ideological as well as a practical agenda. They wanted to demonstrate that they could build a local socialist republic in South London, even if it would be at odds with national government. The council built libraries, baths and parks, and their public health policies included building the first solarium to combat tuberculosis in Britain. Those suffering more severe cases of TB were sent to sanitaria in the Swiss Alps, an unusual use of local authority money in the 1920s. That's one good thing you did, but the solarium is still, we called it solarium, is still there. Take the welfare, they save all the babies there and weigh them there and whatever. And all my children went to get to um, orange juice and stuff like that there. But uh, they really looked after you then, them days, that uh, Dr. Salter did. I think he was a good man, I really do. It was going to the solarium, you were given spoonfuls of malt, I remember, tablespoons of malt. It was a great place, I think. It, it had a strange atmosphere about it, a strange smell, I remember, you know, kind of a medical smell. <laughs> The solarium offered artificial sunshine to thousands of Bermondsey people. Real sunshine was to be found in the summer in the fields of Kent. There was a long-established tradition that each year families would escape the grime of South London and spend weeks picking hops for the beer trade. Hop picking is round again, and the family is sitting out on its pilgrimage to the green fields of Kent. It's a thrill for the kids, new things to see, new games to play, New kids to meet and swap things with. It's a break for Mum. Still plenty of work to do, but she doesn't mind that when there's a change of scene and air to do it in. The popular perception is of chirpy cockneys having a lark in the hop fields, getting fresh air and having a grand old time. It's seen as a distant rural paradise, a taste of the simple joys of the countryside. But Bermondsey Council was having none of that. They produced their own film, a piece of propaganda attempting to deter people from going to Kent to be exploited by the brewing industry. Families went down to the Kent hop fields, then it was regarded as like a working holiday. You know, families didn't have much money and that's what you did. When I was down there, and my memory is of my mother with a long brush and trying to paint the back of my throat and me th trying to throw up, you know. My mother was arguing with the farmer, demanding that he phone the local doctor. My mother spoke to him on the phone and he got in his car and drove straight down to Kent and gathered me up with my mother and brought us back. And then I remember being carried out of the house into an ambulance in a bright red blanket, and I had uh, contracted diphtheria, you know, which is a membrane grown over your throat, and it uh, sort of like suffocates you or strangles you. Apparently, my mother told me later that they told them that there was no hope that you know, I was going to die that night, and then in the morning, the doctor said to her, it's a miracle, he's still alive, but we don't know how and what's happening, and uh, I, as you see, I survived, you know. So that was a miracle, really, for which I'm grateful, you know. Today, summer holidays are spent further afield than Kent, but there are still hops growing in Reverdy Road, a reminder of how the street's working-class families used to spend their summers. The tradition of Christian doctors continued when William Mumford joined the Reverdy practice. He originally intended to be a foreign missionary, but wrote in his diary, after I'd been in Bermondsey for two years, I felt very much that this foreign work wasn't the call after all. I felt increasingly that I wanted to be as good a Christian doctor as I could be, working among ordinary people. <laughs> 